I am so happy to be here. I love this church. If I lived in this area, then I would be here every Sunday. I love your pastor. He and I have been friends for many, many years. He's one of my oldest friends, or my longest friends, and it's a joy to be with him and with uh, his family and with all of you, and I appreciate the very warm welcome. And thanks for the shout out about the books. I hope you'll check the uh, uh, books out there. And the other resources are at my website. So let me say a word about that. It's robertjmorgan.com, just my name. And we have a number of uh, things there that may be helpful to you. Uh, years ago, I wrote a book on church history. And it's in daily segments as a daily devotional telling stories from church history. It was called On This Day. And I asked the publisher um, last year, I said, can we just give this book away? And they agreed. And so we'll send it to your email one segment every day telling you in one day doses stories from Christian history. And you can sign up for that free at my website, robertjmorgan.com. And also we have... Uh, other resources there that may be helpful to you and information about things we're doing. Next year, I'm looking forward to leading a trip to the United Kingdom, to England particularly, to study the places where the great hymns were written. And Charles Billingsley is going with me, and we're going to do it together. And we'll have information about that on our website soon. And also, every day on Facebook and Instagram, I put a 59-second sermon and it's absolutely free. You can check that out. And then finally, on my um, website, there's also a, a place where you can sign up for my free Bible study podcast. It's a weekly podcast, and I just go right now. I'm going through the book of Acts and doing a deep dive into some of the uh, fascinating stories there. So please check all of that out and share it with other people. And again, thank you for letting me be here. Now, the verse we're going to deal with is this verse that uh, Randy Wilson has already mentioned, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And the text says, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that's the greatest promise in the Bible, and I want to tell you today why I think it's the greatest promise in the Bible. But imagine it like this. What if at the moment you were converted, when you were down on your knees at this altar or by your bed, at that moment when you received Christ as Savior, a little certificate fluttered out of heaven and landed at your feet. And you picked it up, and it was a special gift from God. And he said, good for one time only, a redemption voucher, so that at some point, if you have a disaster in your life, you can turn this in, and the Lord will reverse it and bring good out of it and turn it all for good and turn the curse into a blessing. Well, that would be a very precious little piece of paper. You would put it in your lockbox or in your safe at home, and if something happened to you, You'd think, should I use this on this occasion? Maybe I better wait because something worse may happen to me later. But Romans 8.28 is that certificate, but it has no expiration date, and it is good for unnumberable, illimitable occasions. It always works. It is just a redemptive principle in our lives that for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose, whatever happens to you in some way is going to eventually work out for your good. And this is our basis for being optimistic people. This is why we have hope within us, why we can be cheerful, and why we, the followers of Jesus, are the only people in the world who can be genuinely cheerful because we have this promise. Now, I want to begin our study today with not the book of Romans, but the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 20, because I want to give you the background and the context for this promise. So the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 20, I'm going through this right now with my podcast, I'm in chapter 13, 
which is the first missionary journey of Paul, the evangelist, and he finishes that journey, and then he goes on a second missionary journey, and he goes further afield in the second one than he did in the first, and then he goes on a third missionary trip, and this is even further and more extensive, and he is finishing that third missionary journey, and what is he doing? He is planning his fourth missionary journey. He is a strategic thinker. He is thinking about it as carefully and clearly as he can. He's talking to his colleagues about it. He's talking to his traveling companions. He's talking to Luke. He thinks that he can go as far west as you could possibly go in those days, all the way to Western Europe, all the way to Spain and beyond. This was during the days of Emperor Claudius. And this was the known world at that day. And Paul, I think, was dreaming of fulfilling the Great Commission. So he had prayed about it. He had thought about it. He was a man who knew the mind of God. He said, I'm going to finish this third missionary journey. He said, I've been raising money among the European churches for the impoverished Jewish Christians in Judea. So I'm going to go to Jerusalem and leave that money, and then I'm going to go to Rome and use that as a launching pad with their help, because there was a church already at Rome, I'm going to use that as a launching pad to go further west than anybody has ever gone. And this was his great dream and his prayer. And so it says in Acts chapter 20, he is finishing up now the third missionary journey and it says he had had some problems, you know, with in Ephesus, and he left there. And it says in verse 2, he traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. And we know from the book of Romans that he stayed there for three months in the villa of a very wealthy man by the name of Gaius. So what was Paul doing for three months in Corinth? This would have been in Corinth, in Greece. He stayed, he was finishing up his journey. He was heading towards Jerusalem with an offering for the saints. He stopped in Corinth and he stayed there for three months. What was he doing? We don't have any record of his ministry during that three-month period. I'll tell you what he was doing. He was writing the book of Romans. This is where the book of Romans was written in the chronology of the book of Acts. He made it to Corinth, and he's about ready to go to Jerusalem, and he sat down and he said, you know, I want to write to the Romans, to this church that I've never visited. It was started by other people, but I want to write and tell them, here is what I believe, and I am coming to you, and I want you to help me on my journey. Now, I know all of this because of what he says at the end of Romans. So turn over to Romans chapter 15 with me. Romans and chapter number 15. Here at the end of his letter to the Romans, which he wrote in Acts chapter 20, verse 3, at the end of his third missionary journey. Here he says in verse 23, Romans chapter 15 and verse 23. But now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain on my projected fourth missionary journey. I hope to see you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a little while. I'm going to come to you in Rome and stay there for a while and enjoy being with you. And maybe you can give me financial and prayer and personnel, financial help for my journey. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them, for if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on my way so that when I come to you, 
I will come in the full measure of the blessings of Christ. So there was a division in the church in these days between the Jewish Christians that were still very Jewish thinking and the Gentile church in Europe. So Paul was taking up a collection among the Gentile churches to minister to the needs of the Jewish churches, hoping to heal this division in the church and to provide this humanitarian assistance. So he said in Corinth, as he was writing to the Romans, I am going to go to Spain. My fourth missionary journey is already mapped out. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to leave this offering there and then I'll come to you. And with your help, I will go on my fourth and greatest missionary endeavor and we will reach Western Europe. None of that happened. That is not the way things ended. The Apostle Paul, we know in the book of Acts, left Corinth and he went on to Jerusalem. But his presence there caused a riot and he was seized by the Jews and nearly killed until the Roman soldiers rescued him. And then the Roman soldiers stripped him and hung him by thongs in order to flog him, which would have been worse than death, but he at the last minute appealed to his Roman citizenship, so they cut him down without whipping him, but he ended up being in prison there and being endangered for his life, and so they moved him to Caesarea on the coast where the Roman garrison was headquartered, where he would be safe, but he languished there in Caesarea in the prison for two years, and we know very little of what he did during those two years. He did almost nothing. He was just sitting there for two years. He would evangelize the leaders when they called for him, but that was about it. Why was he there for two years? My theory is that his companion, Luke, needed time to write the gospel. And so the gospel of Luke was written during that two-year period. And finally, Paul said, this is getting nowhere. I'm going to appeal to Caesar. And so... They said to Caesar, you have appealed to Caesar, you'll go. And they took him with soldiers down to the harbor, put him on a ship. It was a, it was a hellish experience on board that ship. In chapter 27, the worst shipwreck recorded in the Bible. And he was on this terrible ship. They were going down. They were drenched. It was cold. It was in the middle of the fall. And for weeks, they drifted and then got into a typhoon. Finally, the ship sunk and Paul crawled his way through the barrier and the rocks to the shore, and he was helping to build a fire because they were so cold, and he was bit by a snake, and it was a viper. And finally, they were stranded on Malta for a few months, and when he did make it to Rome, he was in chains, and he was under house arrest for two more years. Five years had passed Two more years, and that's where the book of Acts ends. And he never did make it to Spain within the description of the narrative in the book of Acts. Why was he two years arrested in Rome? Well, so that Luke could write the book of Acts. You know, the story in the book of Acts ends with Paul being in prison. So that's, I think, where Luke wrote the book of Acts. It's also where he wrote some of his other letters. He wrote Philippians. So here we have a man who was a strategic thinker. He was a dreamer. He walked with God. He had his plans all set out. He had people praying for him. And everything fell apart. Nothing went. For years, nothing went the way that he had truly thought that they would. It was one disaster after another. Now, I don't know if anything like that has ever happened in your life, but surely we've had occasions with our children, with our careers, with our finances, with our health, with you name it, where we had plans and we wanted things to happen to unfold in our lives in a particular way, and we prayed about them, and we even felt this is God's will, and everything fell apart. But in this letter, 
that Paul wrote, he did give us the key as to why he never became discouraged during this time. He, so far as we can tell from his writings and from what Luke tells us in the book of Acts, he never became discouraged. He never asked the Lord, why is it that everything has fallen apart? Everything that I'd planned, it's not happening as I expected. He had an understanding that whatever happens to us works together for our good. That we plan our way, but the Lord directs our steps. That even when we have disappointments, they are his appointments. That disappointment is simply God's way of telling us that he's got a different plan for us and that we have to trust him, keep our morale up, and trust in this great promise of Romans 8, 28. And, you know, looking back at it, if these things hadn't happened to Paul, we wouldn't have the book of Luke. We wouldn't have the book of Acts. We wouldn't have some of the prison epistles, such as Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians, which he wrote from his house arrest in Rome. We wouldn't have some of the great uh, truths that permeates the Bible and his writings. It was also true, he told the Philippians, that during this time when he was especially in Rome, he was able to evangelize the entire imperial guard because he was chained to various soldiers 24 hours a day. How would you like to be chained to the Apostle Paul? And many of these soldiers were converted and they took the empire uh, they took the gospel through the empire in areas that he could never have known. I mean, he could, all Paul could do in the light of everything falling apart is look to see how God was using things in a way greater than he could have imagined. He had to lean upon what he had told the Romans in this book in the very middle of the book of Romans. So Romans chapter 8 is, you know, Romans has 16 chapters. It's right in the middle of the book. And the reason that I think it's the greatest promise in the Bible is because the book of Romans is the theological heart of the Bible. It is the spinning core of what the Bible has to say about the greatest truths of being justified by grace and through faith. And Paul begins the book of Romans with a prologue that begins in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And then he begins the first section of his book. It's very laid out, chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, in which he tells us that we have all sinned. There is no way we can get to heaven by trying to be good or trying to keep the law or trying to live a good life because we fall short of that. And then in chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, he tells us that God has provided another way for us to be declared righteous, and that is by the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and faith in him. And then in chapter 4, he says, this is no new doctrine because this is the way Abraham was saved long before the New Testament days began. In chapter 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by grace through faith, we have peace with God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have gained access into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the glory of God. And not only so, but we boast in our sufferings. And he talks about the benefits of our salvation. And then we come to chapter 6, and he says, Even though we have been justified... We have to remember that we are dead to sin, but we still struggle with it, he says in chapter 7. And then he comes to chapter 8, which is the climax, and he says, if you have been justified, you may still struggle with sin, but you have a tremendous help on the inside to give you consistent victory, and that help is the Holy Spirit. And as you read through this, what Randy said rightly is the greatest chapter in the Bible, it is all about the Holy Spirit. This is where, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he says, the Holy Spirit does this for you, and this for you, and this for you. And then we come down to verse number 26. So turn with me now as we zero in on this text with all of that as background to the book of Romans 8:26. It says, here is another thing the Holy Spirit does for you. The Holy Spirit 
prays and intercedes for you with groans which are so deep you can't even understand them. Now, this is a very interesting passage and it's so important for understanding the context of the promise in verse 828. So it says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what we ought to pray for. Do you see that? We are really limited in our ability to know what we should pray for in any kind of definitive way because we don't know perfectly God's will for us in the future. Paul thought that he knew, but he was, you know, he didn't, didn't really know. And we don't know what really is good for us. So we're prone to pray, Lord, I would love to have that job. There is an opening there, and, but we have to say, Lord, if it be your will, because God knows whether in the long run that job is going to be good for us or not. I'll find a young man somewhere in the church, and I'll say, Lord, I'd love to, for one of my granddaughters to marry that guy. <laughs> you know, but I have to say, if it be your will, because, you know, it may be a disaster for them to get married, or it may be God's will, but I have to say, Lord, if it be your will, or Lord, I'd love to have that car, or, you know, but we have to qualify our prayers because we don't fully know the will of God, and we don't fully know the future, but the Holy Spirit being God, does know the mind of God the Father, and he does know the future. And so going back to this text, it says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that cannot be uttered. Now we're told later in the chapter that Jesus also is in heaven interceding for us. You have two prayer partners on either side of the throne of Almighty God, the Father in heaven. Two prayer partners are praying for you concerning the circumstances and the details of your life. And that would be God the Father, I'm God the Spirit, and God the Son, like Aaron and her, one on either side. And verse 27, and he who searches our hearts, being God the Father, knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to say, if it be your will, he knows what God's will is for us. So if you can just imagine in heaven this great throne, it's described for us several times in the Bible. And on one side of the throne, here you have the Holy Spirit, and he knows all about you, and about the details of your life, and he knows God's will, he knows the future, and he is praying for you according to that knowledge, intensely. And you have Jesus Christ who is also making intercession for you. And he is praying for you intently. And because of that, we know that all things work together for good. Now, it's interesting to me that when you look at verse 28, the key subject and verse is not all things work together. It is we know. And then the remainder of the sentence comes out of that. So the emphasis here is on our being persuaded. This is a bedrock understanding of the Christian. This is why we interpret life with its disappointments and with its difficulties differently from anybody else. This is why we can face a hardship and, and we can have clarity in developing encouraging emotions over time because of the basis of this promise. We know that all things, and that little word all is included there on purpose. It didn't have to be. It could just say, we know that things work together for good. But this is qualified. It's not just things, it is everything. I think this is why in Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul wrote while he was under house arrest in Rome, he said, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And so all is a very big word. In fact, I went through the Bible once and found all of the occurrences of the word all, and there were over 5,000 of them. 
And I went through them and I was amazed at how often that word modified our greatest promises. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. Not just casting your cares, but every single one of them, all of them. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And so we have this marvelous little adjective. We know that all things work together. And the Greek word there is the same word when transliterated that we get our word synergy from. All things work together for good. Now it doesn't say that all things are good because some things clearly are not good. Many things are bad. There is evil in the world and there are evil things that happen to us and there are things that may not be evil but appear at the time to be disappointments to us. So he's not saying here that all things are good, but he says that God works all things together. Now this is a promise that is repeated many times in the Bible in various ways. For example, in the story of Balaam, the great lesson of that story in the book of Numbers, and this is repeated both in Deuteronomy and the book of Nehemiah, is that our God is a God who can turn curses into blessings. Well, this is the same idea. If there is something in your life that is a curse, God can turn it into a blessing. We know that all things work together for good, and the qualification is just that we love the Lord. Even a child can do that. We just keep falling in love with the Lord Jesus, and that we're called according to his purpose, which is to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read about in verses 29 and 30. You know, we are to be miniature portraits in this world of our Lord's life-size image. That's our great calling. That's what the Lord is doing within us. And so he uses the trials and the difficulties of life, and that's where we grow spiritually. And that's his purpose for us, that we might grow to be miniature portraits of his life-size image. So we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and to those who are called according to his purpose. And with this, the Apostle Paul ends his great discussion of theology. He goes on with the doxology. But then in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he deals with a subset of the doctrine having to do with the future of the Jewish people. And then in chapters 12 through 16, he deals with what this means to us in practical terms. But this promise, Romans 8, 28, comes at the climax and capstone of the greatest portion of theology there is in all of the Bible. And this is why I say it's the greatest promise in the Bible. This is, it's found many times in the Bible in many different ways, but think about it. This is a promise, it is not easy to do. You know, it's not, there is no easy thing about taking the trials and difficulties in our lives and working them together for good. That is not an easy thing to do. It takes the cooperation and the interaction of all three members of the Trinity. What is Romans about? It is about what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. He died for you. And he rose again for you. And that's the undergirding basis of all of the theology in Romans. His death is redemptive. It not only redeems us, but it redeems all of our situations. So there you have God the Son with his pardon. You have God the Holy Spirit and his prayers And you have God the Father hearing the prayers of the Spirit on the basis of the pardon of the Son, and he brings his providence to bear, and in the overruling providence of God, all things work together for good. So this is a Trinitarian promise. It takes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to bring it to pass. You know, when my wife Katrina, uh, who moved out on me and moved to the city. She's in heaven. I miss her very much, but she passed away after a long struggle with multiple sclerosis. But 
it's been about a year and a half ago, but when we were celebrating our 25th anniversary, I'll never forget that particular day because it was a very, we had so looked forward to spending the day together and that morning we got some horrible news and it just devastated me. But I had a friend who called me, he said, how are you today? And I said, I'm not good. And he said, we ought to be fine, despite that. He said, remember what today is, what is today? And I said, well, it's our anniversary, our 25th anniversary. He said, no, he said, remember what is it on the calendar? It is August 828, it is 828 today. Whatever happened is going to work together for good. And I've never forgotten that moment when he told me that. I think everybody should get married on 828. Actually, 828 is a constantly recurring day on the Christian's calendar every day, if you know the Lord, is 828. Whatever is happening, you give it to the Lord. You give yourself to the Lord and he will work it together for good. So this is the great promise that culminates this particular passage. And when Paul finishes this, all he does is to fall back in exhaustion. And he said, what more shall we say? I don't have anything else to say. What else can I say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is Christ who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Jesus Christ who died for us. Yes, rather, has risen from the dead. What can separate us from his love? Shall persecution or danger or fire or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being slaughtered all day long. We are counted as sheep for the massacre. No, not at all. And all of these things, we are more than victors, conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things that are present, nor things that are in the future shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the promise that is with us every day from Romans 8, 28.